Good morning, everybody. My name is Ken Hermann. I'm a nuclear medicine physician in Essen, uh, Germany. And it's my great pleasure to talk to you today. I'm, of course, quite disappointed that I cannot be there in person. But I think it's a fantastic meeting to have spend the prostate cancer day together. And it's a great opportunity for me as a nuclear medicine physician to talk about the most recent advances of PSMA, PET CT, and Thanostics to such a big crowd of, of people. This being said, these are my disclosures. The first uh, four are the ones which I have to do uh, for EAM reasons. The fifth one I think is the most important because uh, uh, whatever I show you as our data uh, is compiled thanks to the great collaboration with a lot of outstanding people and uh, they're all named here. So thank you very much for having the opportunity with work, to work with you. My talk is uh, structured into four parts. I wanna give you a little bit of background information for Thanostics and specifically PSMA directed diagnostics, then we focus on PSMA PET imaging, what is approved and, and how is it reflected in the guidelines. Then we uh, will move on to the PSMA directed ray ligand therapy, which I think is one of the most exciting things happening in the last years in, in the treatment of prostate cancer. And if we have enough time, we will also talk about opportunities and challenges. The topic of diagnostics made very recently the breakthrough because uh, there is a small editorial actually in Nature Medicine, uh, only three pages long, published in April, showing that we finally arrived uh, to prime time. And, uh, and another very important milestone actually to make, uh, to increase awareness of, of uh, uh, Thanostics was a very recent uh, FDA approval of Provicto. And I will later on discuss a little bit more why this is such an important milestone. The cyanostic principle overall is very simple. What we try to do is we try to deliver radiation, radioactive radiation, very specifically. The aim is that we find targets which are almost exclusively expressed in tumor cells. Uh, and, uh, and then we try to find ligands which bind with a very high specificity to the targets. And if this has been accomplished, all we need to do, we need to make them radioactively hot uh, uh, with either diagnostic or therapeutic gray nuclide where we can then deliver the radiation very focused to these cells. And, and to combine them, we very often use so-called linkers because we have to combine the ligand uh, with the ray nuclide. The example uh, for prostate cancer actually is as a target, uh, we always talk about as a prostate-specific membrane antigen, PSMA. The ligand, which binds with a very high affinity to it, is a called PSMA 617. And then we use such a linker, which is in this case a DOTA, the chelator, and we combine it uh, for the diagnostic with either gallium-68 or flu-18 or for therapy with lutetium-177. Overall, a quite simple principle. The beauty of this principle is that we can see what you treat. And this is an example here of a number of different PSMA PET ligands, some of them labeled with gallium-68, some of them labeled with flu-18. Overall, we don't want to spend too much time about the different uh, specifics of each tracer, but overall, they look all very much the same. We really talk about the same class of imaging. And, and, and just for you to see on the far left in red, one of the most commonly used uh, PSMA PET tracers, you can see the intense focal uptake here in the salivary glands. Uh, this is physiological. You see uptake in the kidneys, a little bit in the liver and the spleen. And you can also see a lot of uptake actually here in the, in the urinary bladder because this tracer is predominantly excreted via the kidneys. However, these errors here indicate nicely a PSMA positive uh, tumor lesions. On the far right, we see a total of four tracers which are labeled through 18. The difference here is that this ray nuclide is derived from cyclotrons, has longer half-life uh, compared to the gallium-68, which is a generator-produced uh, uh, ray nuclide overall. It doesn't really matter. Differences are very subtle. Uh, for the experts uh, among you also very quickly, the two on the right are tracers which are predominantly excreted via the GI tract. So we see less uptake in the urinary bladder, which might uh, again result in certain uh, benefits regarding uh, the local T staging or detection of local recurrence. But overall, we talk about one class of imaging. And if we talk about the paradigm of seeing what you treat, the other part which is very important is obviously treating what you see. And here's an example of a patient. We see the maximum intensity projection of the PSMA PET scan. Everything which is here at black dots outside of what I've shown you previously as physiological uptake, all this is tumor. And we can very nicely see that this patient after two cycles of rutesim PSMA reliance therapy showed a nice response after four cycles. We see only very few PSMA 
uh, positive lesions left. And this can be actually correlated very nicely to PSA as a tumor marker. And we see nicely here that after every cycle of therapy, the PSA dropped. Overall, the patient showed a response from PSA around 1,000 to a PSA below 1. Now, after this short introduction, I want to go a little bit into PSMA PET imaging. I want to kick it off with an overview of all the different uh, PSMA tracers. Don't worry, I'm not going to go into details. I just want to highlight the three on top of it because these are the three which are to some degree already approved. PSMA 11, Gallium PSMA 11, and uh, Fluor 18 labeled DCFPYL, or also called Polarify, are both tracers which are currently already FDA approved. The third one, the Fluor PSMA 1007, is a tracer which is uh, uh, at least uh, having a market authorization in France. Uh, here is phase three data currently published and we expect an extension of the market authorization in Europe, uh, country by country, in the next months. Also important to mention that there's a positive CHMP recommendation for Gallium PSMA 11, so we expect the approval of Gallium PSMA 11 in Europe around Christmas. Now, what were the groundbreaking studies leading to the approval of these PSMA tracers? Uh, one of the indications, primary staging, I just want to very quickly highlight these two studies on the left, it's dealing with Gallium PSMA 11, so-called UCLA, UCSF academic initiative. And what we can see nicely here is that the primary endpoint in this patient was actually detection of the lymph nodes in patients with uh, biopsy-proven prostate cancer. And just looking at the numbers roughly here, you can see that the sensitivity is somewhere around 40%. Not that great, but much better than anything we had before, but a very high specificity. So these are the numbers which actually led to the approval of Gallium PSMA 11 for primary staging. On the right side, a corresponding study for PYL, the Flow 18 labeled version. And if you look at the numbers, they look pretty much the same. Again, primary endpoint, detection of metastatic pelvic lymph nodes. You can see here sensitivity 40%, the same as for PSMA 11. Specificity here 98%. And if you look at pelvic lymph nodes, uh, which are greater than five millimeter in size, you can also see that actually the sensitivity increases from 40% to 60%. Overall, these were quite compelling data. And the missing piece to really get these uh, compounds approved was then the pro PSMA study led from Australia, from Peter Mack, including uh, Michael Hoffman. And the interesting part was done here is that uh, patients were randomized uh, in case of primary staging to either conventional imaging consisting of CT and bone scan or to PSMA PET, and then consecutively patients were crossed over to the corresponding other imaging modality. And the most important thing is when we look at the comparison, we can see that PSMA PET here in red was much more accurate than conventional imaging. And this was true for both sub-analysis of any metastatic disease, if you look at the pelvic lymph nodes or distant metastasis. Also very interesting, when we look at the difference between those two, we can see it's mainly driven by a higher sensitivity of PSMA PET compared to conventional imaging. Now, how this is reflected in the, in the guidelines? We are in Europe. I wanna, that's why I show you the European, the EAU guidelines for primary staging. And here, the summary of evidence, level of evidence 1B, it's quite high. But it says PSMA PET CT is more accurate for staging than CT and bone scan. We have seen this in a pro PSMA study in patients with high risk disease. But up to date, no outcome data exists to inform subsequent management. And this is an also reflected in the recommendations when using PSMA PET or whole body MRI to increase sensitivity, be aware of the lack of outcome data of subsequent treatment changes. This being said, I must say, that, uh, and I will show this later, that in our clinical practice, currently patients with high risk uh, prostate cancer usually receive a PSMA PET. More evidence is actually available and a strong recommendation is available for patients who had under primary treatment and persistent PSA. In this case, it's clearly recommended that patients who have a persistent prostate uh, specific antigen level greater 0.2 should undergo and a PSMA PET if this potentially influences subsequent treatment decisions. And the big breakthrough was actually the APCC meeting and, and Dr. Akrona was uh, with me together in Lugano in the audience when this question was discussed. And, and, uh, and the big question is that despite the, let's say, hesitant recommendation uh, from the EU guidelines, 
the audience uh, was asked uh, how would they use PSMAPET uh, in, uh, for systemic staging and in which uh, uh, constellation. And they actually say, uh, we would recommend upfront PSMA with or without subsequent conventional imaging in case of high risk prostate cancer in addition to the MRI. And the response was actually here 78%, which means consensus. And then uh, uh, Bertrand Tombal from Belgium just said after the discussion, uh, we can continue to discuss for hours, but the PSMA train has left the station. And this is also what we see in clinical routine. A second very important application is the use of PSMA PET in case of biochemical recurrence. Again, uh, two uh, comparative studies here on the left side, uh, Gallium PSMA 11 from the UCLA UCSF academic initiative. Here, the primary endpoint was actually the positive predictive value for, for FDA. And in case of patients uh, undergoing histopathological evaluation, the positive predictive value was 84%. If, because a lot of patients uh, uh, did not really agree to histopathological validation, if uh, imaging was uh, allowed to use for composite validation, we can even see a positive predictive value of 92%. Also very interesting, if you look at the, uh, at the different PSA levels at the time of biochemical recurrence, you can see that the, uh, the likelihood to have a positive PSMA scan increases with an increasing amount of PSA levels. But even at very low levels with the PSA less than 0.5, we can see uh, metastatic uh, lesions in multiple regions, bone metastasic, or even extra pelvic uh, uh, non-bone metastasis. So very interesting. Also intriguing is that the competitive study using PYL, the fluoratin labeled version, uh, has very, very similar results here. Again, looking just at the, at the, uh, uh, at the detection rates, you can see here for different readers, pretty much in the same ballpark as what we have seen here uh, for, for PSMA 11. The primary endpoint in this case was a correct localization rate. And, and you can also very nicely see that the correct localization rate, similar uh, to what we have seen for the PSMA 11 was around 85%, so very much the same ballpark as what we have seen for uh, PSMA 11. Now, looking quickly at the guidelines, this has been actually in the guidelines for quite some years. Uh, very uh, a good statement uh, in case of patients have initially underwent radical prostatectomy. The PSMA PET is recommended if the PSA is created at 0.2 and if the results will influence subsequent treatment decisions. Very important. The PSMA PET should only be done if this really will or potentially could affect the treatment decision. In patients who had initially primary radiotherapy, the recommendation is strength rating is even strong. And here it clearly says perform PSMA PET CT, or if PSMA is not available, other, PSMA, uh, other prostate cancer uh, PET tracers like fluxiclovin and choline in patients fit for curative salvage treatment. And to complement this, this is a recent publication from, uh, from the US, actually an international publication, but published in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine, talking about the appropriate use criteria to implement PSMA pet CT in prostate cancer. It's very important because these criteria are the ones which are highly relevant for the reimbursement. And we just want to focus on the summary, when is PSMA pet appropriate? And you can see in case of localized disease in patients with high risk prostate cancer, and especially with patients with high risk prostate cancer, if the conventional imaging shows M0 disease, in case of biochemical occurrence, both in case of PSA rise after primary radical prostatectomy, but also after primary radiotherapy. Interestingly, in patients uh, with non-metastatic CRPC on conventional imaging, it's also recommended, and I will at a later stage show you uh, why this recommendation, uh, what this recommendation was based on. And you see actually a couple of more indications, I don't wanna spend time on it, where we currently uh, expect the, that PSMA PET might play a role, but we are still currently compiling more data. Now we move to the, I think, very exciting part uh, of PSMA-directed reliance therapy. And I want to start with a little bit historic, uh, historic study. This was the first uh, uh, study, which uh, multicentric study, which was published in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine. A total of 145 patients from 12 German centers uh, were, uh, were evaluated. Uh, it's a retrospective study. I would not even call it a study because it was really a retrospective analysis of patients undergoing so-called compassion use treatment. The very intriguing part is to see that these patients who received PSMA PET at a very, very late line, 
they showed in around 45% of the patients a significant PSA decrease with a PSA decrease greater than 50%. And, uh, uh, and, and even if you increase the number and to look at it, uh, uh, who of the patients showed any kind of response, you can see the number even increased to 60%. This study was kind of, and the results uh, shown that triggered a prospective evaluation again from Peter Mack and, and Michael Hoffman's group, the so-called LUT PCMA trial, a very intriguing study. They highly select patients. They had a FDG PET and, and a PCMA PET only included patients who showed no mismatch on these two traces. And the patients, uh, so the patients uh, enrolled and analyzed. You can see that half of them went uh, uh, the full uh, uh, four to six cycles. In contrast, 16 of the patients, uh, for different reasons, did not uh, uh, receive the full four cycles. Uh, and and the primary endpoint of the study was actually to see how well is the study, is how this well is the therapy tolerated. And when you look at it, the grade three and four toxicities overall. We can see it's very nicely tolerated. There's one patient with grade four thrombocytopenia. Uh, we do see also a lymphocytopenia grade three and anemia, neutropenia, but overall compared to chemotherapy, this tox profile looks very beneficial. And also, even so this was not the primary endpoint of the study, uh, a nice sign of efficacy here. If you use PSA decrease of greater 50% as response, 17 of the 30 patients responded if you even say a PSA decrease of 30% or more is so-called response, then the number of patients or the percentage of patients who benefited from the therapy increased up to 70%. And these two studies together kind of triggered the interest uh, in, this pro in this program and finally resulted in the prospective uh, approval aiming phase three vision study, which uh, many of you might be familiar with. I got, want to very quickly summarize this design here. This is a so-called pivotal study really being designed uh, to potentially achieve uh, FDA and EMA approval. So patients had to have at least one novel antiantrogen therapy, at least one or up to two taxim regimens. Patients were then uh, uh, determined to get a so-called stand of care treatment, which however excluded chemotherapy, immunotherapy, uh, radium therapy. And then the patients were actually randomized two to one into stand of care alone where the standard of care plus up to six cycles of lutetium piece may 617. Also very interesting is that there were two primary endpoints, so-called alternate endpoints. One of them was radiographic progression-free survival, and the second was overall survival. And this, I think, very exciting, very compelling data was then shown at ASCO 2021 and published uh, a few weeks later in the New England Journal. And what we can see very nicely here is that the patients who received uh, Lutetium PSMA 617, in addition to standard of care, had a significant longer overall survival. You can see very nicely here the difference in the curves. You can also see that the medium overall survival was increased by four months, 11.3 compared to 50.3, and also showed an increase and improved RPFS, radiographic progression free survival. Here, the increase was even uh, 8.7 compared to 3.4 months. Also, something very important is always the so-called hazard ratio because it gives us an idea how solid this uh, benefit is. And we can say that uh, an RPFS hazard ratio of 0.4 and an overall survival hazard ratio of 0.62 is pretty much what uh, you would really uh, determine as being robust and solid. Now, survival and improved uh, progression with survival is very important. We know from uh, very recent studies uh, talking to patients what they care most about. Uh, the interesting part is that they care even more about uh, than they care more about survival, they care about quality of life. And that's why I personally care a lot about this analysis, which was uh, shown the first time at ESMO 2021 and is currently uh, uh, hopefully being also uh, scientifically published. What we see here is that independent of what score was used, the FACT-P total score or the PPI SF pain intensity score. But in both cases, we can see that the patients who received lutetium PSMA 617 in addition to standard of care had a significantly later onset of this uh, uh, worsening than if they just received standard of care. And, and here the differences, I think, are very intriguing. The median 9.7 compared to 2.4 months. And for the uh, pain intensity score, the difference of the median uh, time to onset is even 14.3 months compared to 2.9 months. So I think very important that this is not only a life prolonging 
uh, uh, therapy, but it's also a quality of life improving uh, therapy, which I think is very, very important. Uh, again, there is a saying in the US which also says there is no free lunch. Unfortunately, also for therapy, you do need to pay a certain price, which is a toxicity price. And this is a summary of the toxicities of the vision study. And I just want to focus quickly on the grade three to five toxicities. And what we can nicely see here is that the main difference is really in the group of bone marrow suppression, 23% compared to 6.8%. This is significantly higher. All the other ones like dry mouth, nausea and vomiting, renal effects are actually not that significantly different. If you look at bone marrow suppression, the key drivers are leukopenia, lymphopenia, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. But again, these numbers might be a little bit uh, uh, varying for a not so experienced nuclear medicine physician. For an oncologist, this is pretty much what you expect for any kind of chemotherapy. Even uh, this is actually surprisingly uh, well tolerated. Now, uh, another very important trial, uh, which I think many people have talked about as a SERP trial, again from Australia, the interesting part is here that the patients in so-called third line after at least one novel antiantrogen and one uh, chemotherapy were actually randomized one-to-one -one into lutetium PSMA 617 versus cabastaxel, which is uh, quite efficacious and, and available and approved uh, chemotherapy. Patients were nicely selected with PSMA PET and FDG PET. And uh, when we looked first at the progression-free survival data uh, shown and published in, 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 I think, in Lancet Oncology, uh, the, 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 there is a, the curves are crossing, but then you see actually a significant difference in, in RPFS in favor of lutetium PSMA 617. However, now ASCO 2022 in Chicago, uh, the overall survival curves were shown, and you can see certain differences going up and down. You see maybe at the tail end even a certain potential benefit for lutetium PSMA 617. But if you look at the hazard ratio, the p-value, you have to say that there is no difference in overall survival. However, also to be very honest about this, this study was not powered uh, uh, nor uh, included uh, as a primary endpoint uh, differences in overall survival. But uh, my personal take home message from this is we have two very uh, potent therapies. Uh, you can probably give both of them. Uh, and, and when you look at the tox profile, actually it's in favor of lutetium PSMA 617. Now, how is this reflected now in the guidelines? Uh, on the top again, the EAU guidelines. And based on the vision study, uh, the clear statement is uh, you should offer lutetium PSMA 617 to pretreated MCRPC patients if they had one or more metastatic lesions, which are highly PSMA positive on the PSMA PET CT scan. Very important. Here, the clear statement that the PSMA PET CT scan should be performed prior to PSMA relying on therapy. Now, on bottom, these are the very recent uh, ASCO recommendations. Again, the first one is very similar to what I've just told you. They recommend PSMA 617. They recommend that the PSMA PET CT has to be performed. Very important because at the initial discussion at ASCO, uh, the oncologist said with 88% of the patients are PSMA positive, skip the scan. They should just all treat it. I think it's completely against what we believe in. We want to see the target. We believe in personalized medicine. So we are very happy with the statement here. And also very important is because the initial FDA label only included gallium PSMA 11. Here the clear uh, statement that it doesn't matter. As long as we take one of the approved PSMA PET tracers, you should be fine by determining eligibility. And this again, quick highlight, this was a big breakthrough, the FDA approval. Uh, of lutetium PSMA 617, now actually complemented by approval by uh, Health Canada as well as uh, the uh, UK uh, in, in the, uh, the UK. In Europe, we have the positive CHMP recommendation, and we expect the approval around Christmas, actually two or three days before Christmas. But it's a big Christmas present if this finally happens. Now, a short overview. These are a number of different PSMA-directed uh, uh, ray ligand therapies in clinical translation. You can see ranging from phase one to phase three, different ray nuclides. The only one so far which is uh, FDA-approved is the PSMA 617. Now, talking about what is the future looking like, uh, uh, I think the most important thing is that we try to move PSMA ray ligand therapy into earlier lines. There are two prospective phase three studies currently ongoing. There are many ongoing, but are two I want to highlight. One of them is the PSMA addition trial. It's uh, in patients with hormone-sensitive uh, prostate cancer, where patients uh, are uh, studied with standard of care, which in this case is novel antiantrogen versus 
uh, a novel anti antigen plus uh, up to six cycles of TSM PSMA. Very interesting. Second very interesting study is so called PSMA4 study, uh, where patients receive uh, after a novel anti antigen uh, either the second uh, uh, kind of uh, novel anti antigen or uh, um, they receive lutetium PSMA617. This is a study uh, which already finished recruitment and, and we're currently waiting for the readout. And I think ASCO 2023, the PSMA4 data will be presented. In addition to this, these are two academic endeavors. Uh, one of them is a so called lutectomy trial in Australia, where patients uh, receive. Uh, lutetium PSMA prior to surgery and localized disease IV. And, uh, and, and there was very exciting data. And, and the big question is, can we maybe even reduce the number of surgeries or can we at least reduce the number of positive lymph nodes? Uh, second thing here, this is a so-called NAPI study study from Essen, where we really, again, in the near event setting, try to combine lutetium PSMA reliance therapy together with immunotherapy. Now, the last part is talking about opportunities and challenges. I personally, I think always it's the most interesting part. Uh, and to be fully honest, there are so many different uh, opportunities and challenges. I could actually spend an hour talking about it. Don't worry, I'm going to really limit it to five minutes. I want to highlight a few things. One of the challenges and opportunities is the so-called stage migration. Stage migration here as an example is patients which are non-metastatic, uh, uh, on castration resistant positive cancer using conventional imaging. And we have done this study in our center and we performed PSMA PET in these patients. We can see that in 196 of the 200 patients, we had actually a positive PSMA PET scan. And if we look at the, what kind of findings we had, we can see that actually in more than half of the patients, we would actually scratch off the end and would say these patients are MCRPC, which cannot be seen on conventional imaging, but can be seen on PSMA PET. And this is a very important topic because now we need to discuss what, what does this mean? Can we still use the drugs which are uh, uh, approved in NMCRP space? I would say absolutely yes. Uh, but this is something we need to discuss and also because this might also influence uh, the prognosis of certain subgroups. The second big challenge is how can we use PSMA PET for patient selection and response monitoring? And on the left side, I just want to show you, and we don't want to go into details, but there are different ways to assess response to treatment. You can see five different ones, and what you also can see that these results look very different. And this is a big problem, because if a patient is a responder or non-responder, depending on what kind of response assessment you do, then this is very worrisome. So what we need to work on is to actually establish a clear-cut, worldwide established way how to assess response. One of the big challenges, not only to lutetium PSMA reliance therapy, but especially to lutetium PSMA reliance therapy. The second very interesting part is here on the right side. You can see now here actually the event-free survival curves for patients undergoing lutetium PSMA 617 from the, uh, from the vision trial. And you can see that patients who have an initial high PSMA uptake seem to benefit even more from lutetium PSMA 617 than patients who have less PSMA avid lesions. Also very interesting to mention that each of these subgroups, even so not shown here, had a better uh, uh, survival than patients in the control arm if they were matched for uh, PSMA uptake. But again, this is a very important topic. Then I've showed you before the response curves uh, for the vision trial, and even so that they are very convincing, we still have to admit that more than 50% of the patients do not respond. They do not show a PSA decrease of greater than 50%. And what we now currently look, have to look at, we have to find uh, combination partners. We have to look for therapies potentially complementing each other. We do not look for added value. We look for synergistic value. What I want to say is if we combine two therapies, we really hope that the combination of both therapies has a higher effect than each of these uh, therapies alone. And uh, again, here an example, one of the things which is promising, but still very early on is obviously the combination of a ligand therapy and immunotherapy against small numbers, but quite impressive uh, PSA response rates. Even so, we have to admit we are early on. And this slide is just to show you how much different activity is uh, going on there. There's combination trials with immunotherapy, there are combination trials with radiosensitizers, there are new radionuclides, for example, in this case, combining lutetium 177 with actinium, or even the old uh, radium 223. And there are also ways actually try to 
upregulate the PSMA expression, in this case, the uh, NCP trial, again, from Australia. Now, very quickly, uh, I think a very promising, interesting uh, ray nuclide is LED, LED 212 as an alpha uh, emitter. Uh, we have not much experience yet, but overall short-lived generator produced, uh, quite low costs of goods. So I think this is one of the very interesting things to watch for the future. Another very important thing is that we want to treat uh, uh, prostate cancer. We also have to look at other targets outside uh, of PSMA. And here are a couple of different targets where we currently see different clinical trials going on. Before I want to conclude, I want to also say that despite all the excitements, we have certain challenges. We have this therapy now in many parts approved, soon to be approved in Europe, but we need to make sure that this therapy also really gets to patients. So we do have a lack of professionals. We need to make sure that the people who have the patients are aware of the treatment and send them to nuclear medicine or whoever is applying the therapy. And we need to make sure that the economics work. It's an expensive treatment and we need to make sure that this is reimbursed. We need to make sure that the people who apply the therapy are reimbursed. And, and I think these are major challenges. Uh, one of the initiatives I want to quickly highlight is that we have a joint initiative trying to tell people how to set up a diagnostic center because we really believe that this is a very important successful therapy and we need to make sure that this gets to patients. So in summary, again, I'm very sad that I'm not being there in person. I, I am absolutely uh, intrigued by this uh, exciting meeting. I hope I've shown you that diagnostics evolving gray nuclides is now really ready for prime time. The vision study has clearly paved the way to establish PSMA as a volume indication. Um, one of the big interesting parts I personally believe is we need to move PSMA relying therapy into early lines. Overall, I think diagnostics is much more than just PSMA, especially also for prostate cancer. Uh, yes, there are still a couple of opportunities and challenges which need to be addressed. I talked about scale up. We talked about the logistics. Uh, the need to find the perfect partner for combination treatment, and obviously we need to tackle the costs. And the most important part for the nuclear medicine people among you, we need as a field, as nuclear medicine step up, and we need to be more like oncologists, so we need to really oncologize nuclear medicine. And this is my last slide, you believe, see here, in essence, uh, unfortunately, not always a blue sky, but we do believe in diagnostics. we believe in the field of growth of diagnostics. This is my new building, and I hope that uh, next year for Christmas, we're going to have a big uh, moving in party. Thank you very much. And again, uh, uh, if, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I forgot my Twitter account, but uh, obviously if there are any way, uh, please reach out to me and I hope to see you soon. Thank you.